farmers, trust is everything. At Genesis Fertilizers, we're not just proposing to build a facility, we're building a future designed for you. With real progress already underway, we're closer to providing Western Canadian farmers with a reliable, locally produced fertilizer supply. Now is the time to take control of your farm's future. Learn more at genesisfertilizers.com slash credibility. Hi, I'm Amber Bell and this is Real Agriculture. I am here today at the Western Canadian Conference on Soil Health and Grazing and getting the chance to catch up with Bart Lardner of the University of Saskatchewan. So welcome Bart, it's great to see you. Absolutely, great to, to visit with you today too. So you always have a lot going on. Uh, tell me what's been going on in your world. Well, I, I tell uh, a lot of folks when I, do, when I do presentations, I do three things. I, I teach at the university, I teach undergrads and go and teach the vet students across the way and uh, run a fairly big research program. So we have a pretty big lab group, over a dozen people and trying to slow down but it's not working. At this stage of my career they're, they're asking me to look at more, more uh, projects and investigations. My whole program is applied cow-calf reports research so mm -hmm. we're trying to do work that's applicable to the cow-calf producer in specifically Western Canada. but. The third thing I do is outreach, which is tech transfer, and it's, it's interesting that uh, 28 years ago when I started, uh, that work we've done since then is they coin it regenerative ag or sustainable ag, and, and so uh, it's really uh, you know timely, and, and now we're being asked to talk about the results to ranchers in the U.S. And, and ranchers up here in Canada. That's amazing. And what results have you seen? What's the project? Well, the big, the big work we did uh, quite a while ago was look at, you know, that whole animal plant soil interface. And mm -hmm. so, obviously, <clears throat> adopting, integrating different alternate winter grazing programs, whether it's bale graze, swath graze, uh, stockpile, straw chaff, residue utilization. We were just showing, validating what a lot of producers were, were, were finding in terms of rejuvenating old soils, right? So, uh, it was, it was kind of neat that you know, if you have that animal out there on that <clears throat> nutrient deficient acre of land, you're going to capture those manure nutrients. Yeah. And that's, that's a huge benefit in terms of saving, going out and buying nitrogen the following spring, but also uh, the, the, the response that you see on that tired old pasture was phenomenal. So a lot of that, you know, thinking outside the box, uh, moving away from dry lot, confinement uh, mm -hmm. management of beef cattle to extensive grazing and and finding the right system that's going to work for you wherever you ranch or wherever you farm. Right, and winter grazing is always a really hot topic. Um, and I think, I feel like there's been a big uptake in the last little while when it comes to, I mean, it's easier. You're not starting a tractor every day necessarily. Well, I think you have to really do your homework. I mean, uh, I always say start small. Right. So whatever system you're going to bring on to your operation, if you do have the machinery, if you do have the infrastructure, then don't change things. I mean, hopefully it's paid for. And so, you know, but certainly you're going to have two or three systems. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. Mm -hmm. For example, just don't go corn grazing because you might have a bad year and a bad yield. So, yeah, have two or three systems to extend the grazing season. And, and it's driven by economics, or it really is. But the big thing you need to, to, to look out for is ensure that those cows are in good condition coming into that winter program. Mm -hmm. And my objective has always been to maintain body condition. We don't want thin cows, thin cows don't rebreed uh, post calving. And so, you know, manage and monitor accordingly and, and be aware that, you know, we're, we're dealing with, with um, uh, you know, wind chill factors. And so right. cold stress is the big thing. Mm -hmm. And so make sure that those are nutrient dense forages they're out there consuming. Right, so let's talk a little bit about those nutrient-dense forages because a lot of people have been talking about corn and cover crops and there's, you know, I think we're seeing a lot more integration of this cropping idea in with the cattle. So yeah. talk a little bit about that. Well, we've done a lot of corn grazing research in the past, so we looked at different varieties. We looked at uh, some of those newer uh, low-heat unit varieties that were adapted to Western Canada. I was always envious of our Manitoba neighbors or the folks down in Nebraska because they could grow corn. Well, I did not know in my career that we'd be able to, to look at that as an alternate crop. And so we're grazing at whole plant. It's a little different than they do in Nebraska. There, there they graze corn stalks, right. a great, uh, you know, low quality residue. So it really is, you know, getting some experience and, and, and learning how to manage that crop, grazing at whole plant, trying to mitigate rumen acidosis. So that three or four day allocation, we've shown that 
maybe a little fiber to, to buffer that, that room in pH will help as well. Mm -hmm. So that was the, the corn work that we did. <clears throat> and now we're getting into some of this cover crop conversations, which I think as research scientists, we need to be there. Right, for sure. I was actually out at a place on Monday, um, Byron Longs, and he has, he's been playing with the width of corn rows and then cover crops in between. Have you seen a fair bit of that happening? Yes, and in fact, I just was talking to a producer up at Spiritwood yesterday who was bugging me all week and finally we connected. And so he's looking at, um, you know, intercropping that, maybe that protein uh, 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 opportunity. And so if we know corn can be a little bit low on protein for those third trimester beef cows and those calving cows, and so you either have two choices. You grow, uh, you know, another species in there mm -hmm. with that corn crop to improve the protein content of the diet, or you have to go up and find some protein supplementation and so we talked the differences, pros and cons of maybe faba beans versus uh, hairy vetch. Right. And then we talked about you know some of the benefits of both of those uh, potential crops and some of the maybe the some of the cautions we need to think about. Right. And what are some of those cautions? I'd imagine your location is going to be a part of that. Your weather and climate. Yeah, absolutely. So I mean, in my mind, faba beans, although they're not a, really a forage crop, uh, something that we see in front of a beef cow. They are the biggest end fixer. So in terms of biological nitrogen fixation, uh, they will fix the most end for you compared to alfalfa or other, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, uh, nitrogen fixing plants. So, but are they are they palatable? Will the cows get, like them? And so that question's still out there. The jury is still out on that particular project. With the, with the with the hairy vetch, we see that a lot in mixtures. Um, and so I just caution, you know, what you make sure that is it is only a certain portion of the diet. We did have some issues, and there is an anti-quality factor associated with too much hairy vetch in the diet. Uh, we had an issue last year where producers were feeding bales with too much of that vetch in the bale, and there was some anti-quality and some digestive upsets with the beef cows. And so, you know, it's like anything. You need to be aware of, there's, there's good things about a lot of these forward species, but there's some, maybe some anti-quality factors we need to be aware of like glucosinolates or nitrates or other things like that. Right. So yeah. have there been a lot of experiences of bloat when going into cover crops? Like that, I guess I haven't even really considered that. Well, you know, <clears throat> it, you know, and, and so in my mind, we see a couple things happening with these different mixtures. Is that we have the simple mixtures, which are three or four species, and then we have the complex mixtures, which would, could be 12 plus in the, or maybe even 20, who knows. Right. But I'm always selling <clears throat> or asking the producer, if you're going to buy that mixture, I want to make darn sure all 20 of those species are actually going to germinate and contribute contribute to the biomass. I don't want to pay for extra seed that does nothing that for not me, right? Using, yeah. So that's one thing, and I, you know, in the work we've done, uh, the other thing we're addressing is obviously some of the claims in terms of soil health or mm -hmm. or improving soil characterization, specifically soil organic carbon. And so I'm going to talk about that here in my talk tomorrow morning. Is that you know it, it's I think we're just trying to validate some of those claims that we're hearing about uh, the companies that are selling cover crops. And so, yes, in, in my mind, you know, um, I'm, I'm kind of leaning towards the simple uh, three or four species versus maybe the complex of, of 12 plus. That's just my opinion. And right. so, and I also tell producers, make sure that every species in that variety is, is adapted to wherever you farm your ranch, right? You don't want to be buying uh, warm season species that are not going to germinate or produce for you. And so there are some issues in terms of uh, nitrates. We do see with a lot of brassicas in these mixtures some issues with sulfates. Mm -hmm. And so high sulfur content, as we know, uh, we don't want to get over, uh, you know, 0.4% uh, <clears throat> of total diet of, of sulfur. And so it does have an antagonistic effect mm -hmm. on trace mineral absorption by the beef cow, like copper, zinc, and manganese. And so we need to be aware of the level of, of, of or the amount of, of brassicas in that mixture. And so just some things we need to think through uh, when we go to maybe bringing them into our into our grazing system. Right. And I guess my final question, have you looked into a lot of the economics of the practices and what are you seeing? Well, economics has always been a big part of my program and I've worked with probably the best production economist, that's Kathy Larson, in my career. And, and so we're always... Every research study we do, every grad student we have on a project, we bring that economic component into it. But I always tell producers, you know what, these are our numbers in the location we did it in the years that we did it. What is your cost of production? And so that challenges them to go back and, and take their own, their own notes and maybe figure out what is their input cost. You know what, I, I think 
I'm coming away thinking these cover crops do have an opportunity. They might fit that window, that summer slump, that fallish time period. Mm. Maybe if you put the pea and the, and the cereal in there, they're going to bring more uh, energy, uh, you know, content to that diet. In some cases, you know, I think they are comparable to some of our monoculture barley swath graze programs. But once we get into these, um, you know, complex 12 plus uh, species in the mix, maybe their input costs are going to be a little expensive. And so you need to think right. about that as well. On um, years like this year where the market has been really good for cattle. Well, yeah, who knew we'd have $4 calves in 2024, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they're fetching 2000 bucks a pop or more. So, so uh, feedlots are buying them, feedlots are still seeing a profit in the back end because those barley prices are moving for the feedlot diet, right? So right. I guess it's just finding that balance though, there, because we're not always going to have amazing prices. Yeah, no, I think, you know, I think cover crops do have a, you know, a, a good, a good fit. It's just, you know, what is, how many species do I want in the mix? And when am I going to go out there and graze them? That's incredible. Well, I really appreciate <laughs> seeing you. And that was Bart Lardner on Real Agriculture. Did you enjoy this content? Well, don't forget to hit that like button. And you can always sign up for our free customizable newsletters at realagriculture.com slash subscribe. You don't want to miss any of the content that's coming out.